Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for the needle artist. And our needle artist this week from Johannesburg, South Africa, Kelly Fletcher of Kelly Fletcher Needlework Design. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Gary. Thanks for doing this with me. No, it's a pleasure. I've listened to a few of your podcasts, so it's lovely to be on it for a change. Oh, well, thanks for listening. It's uh, not often we get somebody from Africa, so I'm excited to talk to you. Um, yeah, it's a world away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure and it is. pretty close with the internet. So. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the fun thing is we get to do this. If it weren't for the internet, you know, this stuff just wouldn't even be feasible. So. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have a business without the internet. So I I love it. Very yeah. Appreciative of everything that it offers. Yeah, because you're uh, with your Etsy shop and and uh, all your patterns and things. Yeah, that's that gives you access to the world. Yeah. Yeah, I love seeing where all my customers come from, mostly from the U.S., to be honest, Is um, it? but from all over the world. Yeah, Canada, Australia, I've got Singapore, South America. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah, that's fun, and, and and fun for me with these podcasts to hear from people from different parts of the world because, uh, you know, we, we get focused on our own little environment, and we forget that there are people everywhere doing this needle stuff. Yeah, it's definitely an eye-opener, and I find I've learned a lot about other cultures as well through it, you know. Yeah, isn't um, that true? Which is always interesting. Yeah, definitely. You pick up on stuff you never thought you'd ever run across or know just through needlework. It's it's kind of a neat thing, yeah. Yeah, and it, and it brings people together as well. You know, I can chat to somebody in South America, for example, and our lives could be completely different, but when we start talking about needlework – you just come together, you get excited about it. It's interesting to discuss the differences, the similarities. So it's great. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it brings people together. It's lovely. Yeah. Have you always lived in South Africa? Most of my life, yes. I'm born and raised South African. Um, lived for a few years in England, but returned to South Africa um, after that. And yeah, but mostly born and bred South African. Yeah. And I ask that just because I'm curious about your design work and what influences it. And, and I know nothing of the culture of South Africa uh, at all, but um, you know, does, is, are there influences there or maybe not? I, I don't see it in your design. I, I don't see them at all, but uh, uh, you know, I just wonder what's, what's the needlework community like in, in your area? Is it active? Uh, does it draw from different cultures? What uh, what do we see? There's definitely a, a, a stream of embroidery that has a very African feel. A lot of it is to do with upliftment programs, but my style is a lot more universal. I don't really draw on African themes for my designs. It's more, my inspiration comes from everywhere. It could be from a book, a line in a book, a line in a song. It could be something I see. It could be a pattern something like that, that I visualize in stitches. <clears throat> so no, I wouldn't say my design um, influences African at all. I feel, like I was saying with, with the internet, I feel more of a citizen of the world when it comes to design. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to look more for designs that will allow me to use stitches in interesting ways. So if I see something and I think, oh, that would make a great design, and then I look into it more and I sort of start thinking, oh, but actually I'm only going to be able to use maybe two or three different stitches, I tend to abandon it. Um, I My style is very much, it's got a lot of stitches in it, which people tend to enjoy. I think it's the reason why a lot of people do actually buy my patterns. They like the idea that there are a lot of different stitches in it. It keeps the embroidery interesting. It keeps people engaged. And it's also a little bit of a challenge. I think people, people are enjoying learning different stitches. And it's also quite unique to the style of surface embroidery. Um, so I quite like to, if I could say, build a design. I don't like to just stitch over the lines of a picture, for example. I quite like to go a little bit deeper into it, take a look at the design. So, for example, I'll pick up a fly stitch and I'll turn it, I'll manipulate it and adapt it so that it becomes the veins of an insect wing. Or I'll use arrowhead stitches and I'll arrange them in such a way that they become the scales of a fish, for example. So I quite like to use the stitches a little more in depth than just as an outline. Um, so that tends to lead my designs as well quite a bit. Yeah, that, that's what intrigued me just in, in the research 
was that so much of your what you do is oriented or, or, or originates from the stitch itself rather than from a design or uh, some inspiration. You, you really, that stitch, the stitch or stitches seems to really drive what you do and how you go about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it adds a whole nother level to the embroidery. So aside from just, like I said, making it more interesting, it's it just adds, it's, it's kind of like the building blocks of my designs. And I have a lot of old vintage stitch books. So I use quite a lot of different stitches that are popular, as well as I found a few stitches that have either sort of fallen out of use over time, or I adapt a stitch to make it look a certain way. For example, like one of my favorite stitches is Palestrina, which is, it's got the most beautiful rhythm to it, which I know sounds a bit <laughs> arty. But when, when you're actually doing it and you get into it, it, I find it quite soothing. It's got this rhythm and you get into it and you just keep going and keep going. But from a visual point of view, you can also adapt the length of the original stitch. So you can either do it really small and you get this beautiful raised textured knotted row of stitching, or you can give it these long legs, which give it a totally different look. So, yeah, I love the stitches. It's yeah, and I, I wonder, evident. I wonder if we'll ever get to a point where we quit discovering stitches. You know, you talk you know, stitches that have fallen out of use, and you find them in old books. It, it seems like there's got to be a limit somewhere, but I'm not sure there is. I don't think so, because you know, I've I'm mostly self-taught. I've learned a lot from books, um, and. <laughs> trial and error shall we say well i've yeah. made mistakes with stitches and i've suddenly thought like oh actually that's a really great variation i was doing wheatier stitch and i'd forgotten how to do it and i was doing it well technically wrong i suppose in square in scare quotes but i had a look at it and i was actually and i thought to myself well actually this looks pretty good i think i'm gonna <laughs> make a note of that <laughs> <laughs> and i might actually add it in my next stitch book, <laughs> right. if that eventually ever comes around. So, no, I don't think we'll ever run out of stitches. Um, you just need to look at something like Crazy Patchwork and all the different combinations of stitches being used there. And it's endless. I mean, you could combine pretty much anything, come up with a new stitch that way, or make a mistake and discover a new stitch that way. I yeah. don't think we'll run out. Yeah how, how many, run out. yeah, how many stitches have come out of mistakes? Lots of them, yeah. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah. And and that and then people like you who are taking a stitch and saying, all right, how can I extend this? Uh, it just starts to open a whole new catalog of of ways to to do a particular stitch, variations that uh, just adds and adds and adds. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure we'll ever run out of them. That's, um, and then, I hope we don't. No. And then, of course, <laughs> with all the threads we have available, it just it offers – even the same stitch can look so different depending on the thread. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Or different threads or even just different numbers of strands of six-stranded thread. Yeah, it's, you, can, you can really play around and, and go down into great levels of detail that way as well. Yeah. It interested me looking at your designs because the, the majority of your designs are, are more, and I don't know if this is the right description, but more of an outline type design where, where you have a lot of open space. but then And so then you look at it initially and you go, okay, those, those are nice. But then when you study it and you see the stitches involved and the, the texture that you bring out, it really starts to, for at least for me, it took on a whole new dimension uh, of your designs did just as I started to study it and say, oh, look what she did with that stitch. And look how, you know, I can see how the light reflects or the texture plays off of another texture and how, how do you uh, how does that work in your head that that you do your designs this way well it's probably like one of my customers came up with a lovely phrase a few years back and she said to me your designs are deceptively simple so like you said there it is lines, there it is right there deceptively yeah, simple yeah. i like that yeah yeah it's a lovely phrase and i thought to myself yes actually that's that's right it's exactly it describes them to a T because when you first look at them it just it looks pretty simple it looks like an outline it looks like I've stitched over it but when you as you said get more into it it's I like to use the different stitches and I think that just adds that level and that's what's appealing to people at the moment so at the same time that the the 
sort of open outline design style that you describe. It's, I like to come up with modern designs and I also like to come up with designs that are fairly quick to finish. So this style works well with that. But to be honest, it's not a style that I really set out to achieve in any way. It just kind of happened organically. And I guess it's just the way I do it now. Um, <laughs> I'm still learning all the time as well. So you can definitely, if you look at my older designs, you can definitely see how how they've progressed. Oh, yeah. You can see my how my design skills have improved, I like to think. And also the use of stitches. I think it's improved over time as well as color. So yeah. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Well, that's good because if, if you quit learning, you're in trouble. Just fair warning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Loses, well, all the, loses all the excitement. Yeah. And and I could. I, I did go back at the early designs, and, and I could definitely see a progression. I could see the, the sophistication coming in, and it was fun to look at. I actually got trapped into that that vortex of, oh, no, an hour went by. How did that happen? But, uh, well, yeah, I'm, you can I'm impressed see it. You. Yeah, I'm impressed you took the time to do it. I um. You know, I think back to, I started out about developing patterns, what about, t it's 10 years ago now, actually, my 10th birthday, you could call it, comes up now in November. And um, yeah, definite improvement. I look back on some of the older designs and I think to myself, hmm, should that even still be out there? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's your, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a progress. You've, you've got to look through it. You've got to go through it. And now I'm at the point where I've probably got about, 170 patterns available somewhere uh, around there mm -hmm. at last look um, and that's excluding plus the the ebooks of course and that's excluding all the designs i've done for for the books and the kits and the magazines and so on so it's it's quite a lot of patterns since then quite a lot of practice quite a lot of learning yeah well and and your designs lend themselves really well these to, to the trend these days to decorate clothing a lot, yes. lot of young people uh, are picking up embroidery as a way of, of putting a little something on a blouse or on a pair of pants. And your designs really, really do that well. And, and like you said, offer that little challenge of the stitches. And that, that, that also caught my eye because I could see how people could pick those up and say, all right, I'm going to put this on a blouse here. And that, that's going to add a little something, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm quite practical by nature, so I do like to come up with ideas for how to use the designs as well. But with the clothing side of it, I mean, I find embroiderers, they're quite innovative and creative people on the whole. They don't really tend to always follow a pattern or, you know, they, they tend to use the designs in all sorts of different ways and they have projects in mind. Um, so I don't really push it. If I, if I have an idea, you know, I've done um, monogram notebook covers, for example, so I would do that, but otherwise I just publish the design as is and then wait to see how people use it. Um, interestingly, I, I share quite a lot of my customers' work on my Facebook page, and those posts always get loads of likes. Um, I think they inspire people. It gives people ideas on how to use it. I've done quite a lot of the smaller designs. I'm thinking of the, the fruit and the veg designs in particular. People have been done so many tea towels with those on, yes. which is nice. It's a, it's a quick It's a quick project. It's fun. A lot of people give them away as gifts, which is nice. A lot of my insect designs and all the creatures, you know, the, um, the sea creatures and the snail, those ones, people have made, a lot of people have made quilts out of them. You know, they do an insect per block or a creature per block mm -hmm. and then, you know, match up the thread colors to their fabric colors. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely to see that sort of thing. Um, and then, yeah, gifts. A lot of people are looking for items to, that they can then give on as gifts, especially with Christmas coming up. A lot of people use my monogram pipe patterns and then monogram gifts for people for Christmas. So it's nice. It's nice that people are giving handmade, and it's lovely to know that you've given them a design that's inspired <laughs> them to then make something. So that's a, that's a good part of it as well. Yeah, that as a designer, that must get your heart beating a little bit faster when you see one of your designs being used for like a tea towel or whatever it might be, but just to see the different ways that, that a, a design that you thought was nice, put it together, put it out there, and let's see what happens. It must be exciting to see people actually take that and apply it to something. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, it's so weird. It's it's such a strange feeling to see something that you've just worked on quietly. I work from home, so I've just worked on it quietly in my little studio space in the corner of our living room. And then suddenly out the blue, I'll get an email with all these pictures and someone will say, oh, I bought these a year ago sometimes. <laughs> yes. I made it into this and here's a picture of my work. And then I just sit there and I just sit looking at it with a smile on my face. It makes my day so great. Yes. <laughs> it's It's such a nice feeling. It's... And it's it's just so nice to know that I've had quite a few people get back to me saying, oh, I saw your patterns on wherever, and it's inspired me to pick up a needle and do embroidery again, or someone who said, someone who's in their 60s, and they tell me they've lasted embroidery when they were at school, and they've now decided to start embroidering again. And that, that I think, makes me happier than than anything. Right, just right. The, just the fact that you, just me putting myself out there and putting a design out there, has actually impacted someone and got them to pick up a needle again and they're loving embroidering and it's giving them something that they enjoy doing. That's a great feeling. Yeah. And, and that's interesting that I put a design out and a year later it shows up in some way because so many, you know, so many of those people will get them, sit on them and then oh, there's, there's the opportunity to use this and, and uh, something you've probably forgotten about then all of a sudden pops up and that's gotta be fun. Yeah, it's it's nice, and it's it's really nice to and just to see what people are doing with it. You know, some people do them in completely different colors, some people make something out of them, some people split them up and do them differently or change the stitches. And like I said, embroiderers embroiderers they they do things their own way, <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice it's nice to see. I enjoy it. Now you said you were self taught uh, as a child or later in life that you started doing uh, embroidery, or did you start? I'm not cross stitch from a kid from her mother or something i am largely self-taught i mainly from books and just from trial and error to be honest but i did grow up around needles and thread and fabric and wool um my maternal family were all very practical practical strong women they they did needlework they knitted they crocheted they sewed they did a little bit of embroidery they gardened they cooked so all those domestic arts they were really good at all of that so it, it was a little bit ingrained, to be honest. My <laughs> mom was the one. Who, my mom was the one who actually got into embroidery, and so I obviously saw her embroidering and what she was doing. I had absolutely no interest in it as a teenager, obviously, but probably You're towards my <laughs> yeah, as, yeah, as all teenagers. But it was probably around my mid twenties. I actually didn't get into embroidery first. I actually started quilting first. And I've always loved fabric. With my mom being such a prolific sewer, we were always in and out of fabric stores as kids. I love the smell of a fabric shop. It's so nostalgic for me. Um, it's a happy place to be for me. And so I just thought that I would be a quilter. And I didn't even think of it as a career either, although I did sort of think, oh, it would be really nice to design my own fabric one day. But it was just a notion. It was It was nothing serious. And quilting then led to applique, which led to embroidered applique. And then we were on a family holiday, and it must have been around 2004-ish. Um, and I was bored, and my mom was embroidering. And she said, gave me a, eventually gave me the square of fabric in, and her stitch, A to Z stitch book, the Inspirations one, which I'm sure most of us have. And she said to me, just, just stitch something, keep yourself busy. And she says that I'm remembering it wrong <laughs> that I'd been in, I'd started embroidering before this, but anyway, that's the memory that sticks in my mind as the start of, let's call it, my love affair with embroidery, because I'm pretty passionate about it. I do love it, and I think it was because it was the first time I'd really, really gotten into the, the intricacies of the stitches. It was the first time I'd really considered how to do them, seen, actually, consciously looked at the book and seen how many different stitches there were how you could adapt them. And yeah, I immediately started thinking like, oh, you could use this for this and that for that. And yeah, so I think that was, that's sort of roughly when I really started getting into embroidery. Um, and it's just, I've just carried on since then. I just, I haven't stopped. Yeah, but see there's, you know, even though you weren't stitching as a five-year-old, you, you, you had that culture around you. And like you said, in and out of fabric stores, fa fabric stores are a happy place. You had that around you, and, and we see that time and time again where uh, a child gets exposed and, and, you know, like as a teenager, I don't want anything to do with that. I got, I got other things to do. 
but then it comes back and you you have a moment in life and you and, and it just the spark rekindles and there you go yeah i found out later in life actually my my dad's parents died young and actually we found out later in life that his mom actually also did embroidery no oh. so I don't, I don't know maybe it's a little bit genetic as well <laughs> Maybe I didn't, well. don't really have a choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Forced into it by genes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so is it all? So, from that time, was it always embroidery, or have you dabbled in other techniques? Uh, within embroidery, I mean, oh, there's so many different embroidery techniques, and I, I have, I've tried a bit of gold work. I've done a bit of Mount Millic. I've done a bit of black work, but I like the freedom of creative surface embroidery, which is the style that I do. Uh, and and it's all to do with the variety of stitches. It's the fact that it's just done on on smooth fabric, and I can create anything on it. I'm not limited. You know, like um, a counted counted um, work. You you limited by your fabric, right? And you can only stick your needle into certain areas of the fabric. Whereas with this kind of cr surface embroidery, you can. It's really free form. You can. I can make it do anything I wanted to do. And I think I like that freedom. I like that. I like the idea that I can be completely creative. I can come up with any design and I can make it work. So yeah, that's, I see, that's, that's a, why I stick with this stuff. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Cause see, now I come from a counted world, needlepoint primarily and, and do a lot of counted cross stitch and, and other things all on, uh, on basically gridded fabric, you know, grid fabric. <clears throat> and the, the little uh, embroidery that I've tried, even though the line is there, that's that's been the biggest stumbling block for me is that there are no boundaries that confine me and and it's kind of a little bit freaky because i you know i wait i could just go anywhere and if i want this to be bigger it could be bigger and then then my mind goes yeah but you should have a, a specific hole that that needle goes in and no other you know and no other hole so it's 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 a different mentality uh the, you know the approach and i i have to say that that makes it makes free form embroidery or freehand embroidery not not challenging technically but but mentally it's wait a minute there's nobody saying i can't go over here and uh, that's that that's been hard for me yeah it it is the different mindset i think and and i think that's something that stops a lot of people from trying the style of embroidery it is something I've thought about, and I have had a few people who have, who are cross stitchers, who have started with my designs, and it's actually the reason why I recently put out quite a few uh, smaller samplers. They've literally just small designs. They fit into a five-inch hoop, three stitches, four stitches. That's mm -hmm. it. And it's I did that because I had a lot of people who were getting in touch saying, "I've never done this style of embroidery before." would I be able to do it? I've done a bit of cross stitch or I've done tapestry work, something like that. And so I decided, okay, well, these, these people need an introduction to this. And that's how I, that's why I started putting out the smaller samplers that came out recently. So, you know, there's nothing also, there's nothing more disheartening than a project that just never seems to end. Yeah. So <laughs> a smaller design like that, it's, it's, people don't find it overwhelming. It's not intimidating. It's something that people look at and think, oh, hang on, maybe I could actually do that. <laughs> so, yeah, my smaller designs, that's where you start. If you've never done it, if you feel a little bit intimidated by the fact that you can just stitch anywhere you want, then that's a good place to start. So Yeah, and, and isn't that true? Yeah, you dive in with one that's too big and, and it, it, will this ever end? Will I ever get out from under this? And it, it saps yeah. the fun out of it, yeah. Absolutely. And then on top of that, you never, you know, that, that you'll know that feeling that you get when you finish a project sure. and you sit back and you look at it and you feel so satisfied and you feel so like, wow, I did this. And I think that's the feeling that keeps most of us embroidering. So if you don't feel that <clears throat> ever or not often enough, it's also going to put you off. You're not going to want to keep going. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to, to start small, build your way up. I learned the hard way, of course. I jumped in with two feet, <laughs> had these <laughs> grand, grand projects initially, and then eventually realized, no, just break it down. Just go back to basics. Just start small. And yeah, I, my designs, they're, they're quick. You can, you can do most of them in a weekend, 
and the bigger designs you could you know once you're feeling more comfortable you can get into it but they're still made up of various elements so you could you get that feeling in mini doses when you finish for example if you take my wild coral pattern for example it's made up of individual pieces of coral and so when you finish each one you get that feeling of okay i finished that one that's great i feel good now i feel inspired to move on to the next one right. so yeah that feeling's important i think it's important yeah well, and that's on, on bigger projects, uh, that's the, the mental approach. It really is to not look at the whole project and will it ever get done, but to break it into pieces mentally and say, all right, you know, this is my next goal here. And then set back and enjoy the fact that you got that part done. Yeah, it's important. And I, I think the other thing as well with hand embroidery is it's, it's so unique to each person who's doing it. And I think this is the same even for, you know, counted work. I think, Every, everybody's embroidery is going to look different. Mine's going to look different to yours. Yours will look different to your friends. And that's the nature of hand embroidery. I, I, I think that's what makes it special is you, the way you do my design may not look the same as mine, but it will be individual to you. And it doesn't mean that you can't do it or you shouldn't try it. And I think it's important for people to know that, that it's, you know, and it's an expression of self. And it's a you just got to keep going and just keep giving it a try and doing it. Your palette is so bright, so bright and cheery. Is that just a reflection of personality, uh, intentional? I mean, just, just all your pieces, they just have this brightness to them. I really enjoyed that. Oh, thanks. I spent quite a long time actually picking out colorways for my designs. I think color is one of the first things people notice, even before the design itself, possibly. And colors, for me, they can, they can change the look and feel of a project completely. So I tend to think of my designs, I tend to often think of my designs as, as stitched illustrations almost. And illustrations are generally pretty colorful. So, you know, it helps set the tone for a piece. It adds to the final look. And it's a lot trickier than you think trying to make something like a snail look good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll say. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like the challenge of it. I was obviously very excited. I use DMC threads just because they're available all over the world and it's easy for customers to, to find them. And I was very excited when they brought out just 15 new colors. Mm -hmm. I was very grateful for that. <laughs> so, but yeah, I've, I've used most of their colors. I, I tend to stick with, as you've noticed, I, I tend to stick with the brighter colors, the more vibrant colors. Unless something like one of my popular designs is a moth, and there I went with quite subtle sort of dusky pinks and mm -hmm. peachy colors, which is a moth. So they worked well there. But I do try and going back to the snail, for example, I do try and choose the, the lighter, brighter shades of a color. So instead of using the dark brown for the snail, I, I did try and pick like a lighter, more caramel color and then mix it in with a little bit of yellow to brighten it up. And so it, it's, it's quite a fun process choosing the colors. And People might change them, but also they might not. They might just love the, be attracted to the color first, you know, right. and want to keep that. So yeah, it's I think, not a, I think it's, yeah. it plays a big role. It's not every day if someone holds a snail up and says, isn't this beautiful? <laughs> 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 exactly. I had another customer saying to me, only you could make a bug look good. <laughs> I, took that, I took that as a compliment. Yeah. Like, oh, I'll yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, that's a plus on several fronts. Take that. Yeah, yep. ab absolutely. Yeah. Well, Arlene and I were talking, uh, oh, two, three weeks ago, the, the question, can we do without DMC? And, and we concluded you couldn't uh, and, and for several reasons, but one of them is that universal availability and then, of course, the, the range of colors uh, virtually unmatched by anyone else and, uh, uh, and of course, affordable. You, you know, people, can, yeah. can, people can get into – it really lowers the barrier to getting into this hobby because the, the very tools you need, needle and thread, are not that expensive. Exactly. All the reasons you've just said, that's why I use it. I um, I do like their colors. They color fast as well if you need to wash your fabric after you've embroidered it. I work, you've, as you've seen, on, on white fabric mostly, so the colors really stand out. We've got two great uh, thread producers here in South Africa, Chameleon Threads and House of Embroidery. And I would love to be able to use their threads more, but they're just not as widely available. Mm -hmm. if, I've got, if I've got somebody in Chile or somebody in Thailand, 
I need to know that they can get those threads right. and those colors. So not everyone's confident choosing their own colors. So they, they want to be told what colors to use, you know. Yeah, and, and your designs, which which lend themselves really well to tea towels, napkins, those kinds of things, the color fastness almost becomes essential. Absolutely. They've got to go through the wash, so yeah. it needs to be. It's an important thing, yeah. Celtic stems, your first design. Yes. You said you said somewhere that, that it, it's always been a big seller. As you look back, still hold up? It's still selling today. I sold it again the other day. Okay. Not as regularly as it did in the beginning, but it's still selling today. So I think with that, most of my designs are just straight embroidery, uh, just with needle and thread. But that's one of the designs where I've brought in a bit of applique. There's a bit of beadwork in there. It was, like I said, one of my ambitious early designs. <laughs> but that's one of the designs that people people have really adapted. They've they've split it up and used it on on napkins. That was one 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 woman did. And I think just the the texture of it appeals. I think people like the idea of using fabric. It's a lovely way if you've got special pieces of fabric that are too small to use in a quilt, for example. You can use it in this design. You can just use those tiny bits. So. Yeah, well, that was my reaction because I, I read that that was your first design and then went, went and looked to see, you know, <laughs> was it really crude? Was it, you know, the, the, where did she start? And I thought, boy, that's a pretty good start right there. You <laughs> you hit a good one right out of the gate. And then, <laughs> then you got to follow up. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually, that was the first pattern that I that I published as a standalone pattern. It came after I was living in England, and I actually designed some applique cushions, mm -hmm. which my mom made, funnily enough. And I approached British Patchwork and Quilting magazine at the time, and they wanted to publish just one. But they did say they would showcase all six. And then they said, well, if you just make the patterns available somewhere else, we'll let people know how to find them. So that was sort of the start. That came just before Celtic Stems. So I quickly put the patterns together, opened a PayPal account very quickly, and then <laughs> I had a blog at the time. So I just put the patterns up on the blog, and I think I sold 11, about 11 or so sets, and those are my first, first customers. So I didn't even have a shop or anything at that stage. <laughs> and funnily enough, one of those one of those ladies who bought those patterns from me, I think she's she's still buying from me today, which is oh. great. I mean, that's a that's a great endorsement. So that's kind of where it started. What got me thinking about about digital patterns in particular, and then obviously living in London at the time, where internet was compared with South Africa, internet was cheap. It mm -hmm. was unlimited. Mm -hmm. You could do anything. Well, we did everything online there from streaming to everything. And so that's what really got me thinking about opening, developing patterns and selling them in a digital format as well. Anyway, so, so that's kind of how it all started, um, the, the PDF patterns. And then Celtic Stems was, it was a design I'd been working on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So, And that was the first, when I did open a proper online shop, as proper as could be at that time. That's that was my first pattern. Um, so yeah, it all sort of snowballed from there. And then now everything that you have is uh, is available through your Etsy shop, then. Yeah, all the stuff. You know, I I do a lot of editorial work as well. I started doing that as well before I really got the patterns going. Um, so the it, if it's not in a book, it'll be on my website as a yeah. pattern. Yeah, and, and as a magazine editor, I was intrigued by, I'm always intrigued by people who produce stuff for magazines. Uh, and well, you've done some for Inspirations and I'm sure other magazines. What, uh, is there an extra, extra challenge when you set out to do something there or do you find yourself just choosing from what you've already done? Uh, what, what's the, I, I'm curious about the mental process of saying, all right, I've got to come up with a design especially for some, a magazine such as, you know, the caliber of inspirations. What does that, do you feel extra pressure or do you, is it just, well, this is what I have and we go with it. I think in the beginning there was pressure. Of course, you know, when, when you first, when you're first approached by somebody like, I mean, inspirations magazine and they say, we've seen your work, 
would you consider doing a project for us? I think then there's definitely pressure. But, you know, I, I've i worked in media and publishing my whole life. I still do as a freelancer, as a freelance editor. So I knew the process. So I knew what it took. I knew about paginations. I knew about deadlines. I knew what the editors would need from me. When they used terminology, I knew what they meant. So that definitely took off a lot of the pressure initially. And now, I mean, you know, I'm bringing out a new pattern, a new design, probably for at least one a month, if not more. So I just added into the into the lineup, <laughs> and it's 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 fun for me. I love it. I love. I, I've always loved books and magazines. So for me, it's sort of the ultimate. It's just it's really rewarding. It's such a nice experience. It's really great for getting your work out there. A lot of people fi- have found me through inspirations, but. As much as I do love it, it does take a lot of time, yeah, more, so sure. than, more so than my patterns do, for example. And it doesn't always generate a livable income, shall we call it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I, I, I love the editorial work, though. So I do balance it out now with my patterns and ebooks. And over the past, like we said, 10 years, I've managed to find a balance. So it's really good. Um, editorial work, there's also this collaborative aspect, which I really enjoy. Um, it's just a, it's a nice change from the patterns and ebooks, which is just me working on my own. And I always find I learn something where I meet someone new or I get introduced to a new technique or a new way of doing things. So it's, it's a good learning curve for me as well. Um, the projects that I had published in Inspirations magazine in Australia were, were when Anna Scott was editor. She, she liked the fact that my style was a little bit more modern and she particularly liked the combination of applique and embroidery, like you saw in Celtic stems. So they, they, their approach is quite hands-off. They quite like you to come up with the design, to come up with the idea how you want to do it. And they kind of leave it up to you mostly. But then, of course, they come in and they photograph your project so beautifully. It's beautifully styled. The lighting is great. They, their articles are so detailed, which is lovely. And if I've used a less common stitch, for example, in one of the projects I used, palestrina stitch which I then interlaced from both sides which was a stitch they said they didn't know so then they were quite happy to include the stitch instructions as well mm-hmm. rather than rather than say to me oh you'll have to use a different stitch they were like it's no problem we'll include the stitch instructions which I thought was great yeah so I love that um I've also worked with it, it in sort of in contrast to inspirations magazine I've worked with a magazine here in South Africa called ideas and their editorial vision, it's, it's quite honed. They know what they like. They know what they don't like. They know what they want. And they either ask me to design and embroider a specific idea. So, for example, I did an embroidered tablecloth for them, which had a plate, an embroidered plate at each plate setting. So they came up with the concept for the idea and then asked me, could I embroider the specific thing for them? which was great. You know, sometimes it's nice to just be told, hey, can you yeah. embroider this? And I go, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I designed and embroidered it. But it Isn't that true? Right do it this way and, and just execute it. Yeah, okay, all right, mindless. I can do that, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it was great. And I mean, you know, that that's, those sorts of projects then led to me doing a whole embroidery supplement for them, which was a standalone magazine that came out mm-hmm. as one of a series of four. So it leads to... You know, one thing leads to another. If they like the way you work or if they like your ideas, you know, then they ask you to do more, which is which is nice. You can build up a relationship with people and, and be a part of that magazine without actually being on the editorial team. Right, right. So, yeah, it's 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 that was great in particular because I had a whole team of people giving me input right down <laughs> to thread colors and fabric choices. And I really enjoyed it. I, I felt like I was getting this whole like team giving me input on my ideas and I was getting all this feedback and I don't always get that. So I enjoy that experience. Right, it's, yeah. it's really nice. And then of course, when you see your work all professionally styled and photographed and in print, you, you do have that little feeling of, yes, I've made it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It well, yeah, that, that, that adds that extra dimension. Well, I didn't realize you had a, an editorial background. You're, you're like gold to those magazines. They don't have to paint a picture for you. Yeah, I, th- I think they like it. It saves, yeah. saves a lot of time for them having to explain things or having to redo things. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I keep asking you to do things too. Yeah. <laughs> she sends a package of material and it's over. Yeah. I make their lives easy. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and that's, you know, as, as an editor, you know, I've said that a thousand times to PR people. You know, the easier you make my job, the more you'll coverage you'll get. I mean, it's just human nature. Um, if I have to work extra hard at, at what you send me, uh, it gets set aside for when I have time, and I can tell you about how often that happens. So, uh, uh, you know, have, are you going to run that? Yeah, as soon as I get a couple of days to clean up the mess, I will. And, exactly. Um, uh, but then something comes in, like from somebody like you, oh, boy, I can just touch this up and go with it. That's, oh, man, that's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it, it makes a big difference. It's, it saves it saves editors time, which is I yep. think the main thing. Oh and yeah. It's and and po probably money sometimes as well. I'm just I'm thinking about when I did my book, I could I literally sent them. I work in Adobe InDesign, which just to backtrack a little bit, the reason I work in that program is because I used to work as a layout artist as well. Mm -hmm. So it was just the program that I knew. And because I don't have a traditional art background, I've kind of come up with this technique, I guess, of designing, where it's a combination of using software and hand drawing for the stitches, etc. So when a publisher says, great, can you send the line drawings for your book? I'm not going to send them hand-drawn yeah. images. They're all already done. Right. in something like InDesign, which you could import into Illustrator, which is what they often use. So it definitely saves them a lot of time and effort from that point of view. So it works, and it's it's kind of been the, my story, I guess, is combining skills that I've learned working in media and publishing with embroidery to be able to create the patterns that I do, to be able to put together an ebook on my own and not need to outsource that to anybody. Right. I can just do it on my own. I can do the design, the layout. I can edit the text. I can come up with titles, all that sort of thing. So it's definitely been a happy, a happy confluence of events. Yeah, that's a powerful set of tools right there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I remember on one of the more businessy podcasts I used to listen to someone saying, if you can find two things that you're good at and combine them to create something unique, that's when you've got something winning on your hands. <laughs> and I just sort of like a little light bulb moment for me. I thought, oh, it's kind of what I've done. I've combined these publishing skills with embroidery, you know, to be able right. to, to do, to do what I do and to do what I love doing and create a career out of it, which is pretty special if you think about it. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. That's, um, a lot of people hope they can do that one day, and you've gotten somewhere with it. Talk about your books now. You've got 120 embroidery stitches, embroidery tips, tricks, and techniques, and then the embroidered home. Now, that's a that's a project book, right? Yes, it is. It was, it was such a surreal experience, actually. I ended up getting two emails out of the blue, and I know you won't believe me, but on exactly the same day, and... They were both for book projects. So one was from a publisher called Kyle Books in London, and the other was from Becker and Mayer, a publisher in the States, which hmm. is now part of Quarto Publishing. Uh -huh. um, fortunately, one was a request to design a kit, and the other was to write a book, which turned out to be Embroidered Home. So, yeah, Embroidered Home is a, it's, it's a project book, and it's probably got about 70-odd designs for you to embroider and then a lot of those designs have actually we've actually sewn up into items as well wait se so it's, 17 it's or 70 <laughs> 70 seven oh seven oh holy smokes yeah. <laughs> it was very ambitious i'll it's say <laughs> so a lot holy of them, smokes that's a lot <laughs> but as you know with my designs a lot of them are small so <laughs> I don't Which care. Is, seventy designs is seventy designs is a lot of designs. I don't care how big they it, are. <laughs> yeah, it it was a lot. It was it was ambitious. And fortunately, my mom being an embroiderer, she she stitched her fingers to the bone <laughs> helping me <laughs> stitch up all the samples for photography. She even hand quilted a quilt for the book. So oh my. <laughs> yeah, she was a huge help. She was a massive help during that time. And while I was doing the book, I was trying to do the kit as well which was on a much smaller scale. It was just 12 designs. But what was nice about that was it led to, I've done four now altogether, and they've been packaged as a range called embroidery designs. And those are quite nice because they are 
self-contained. They, you, you get your thread, your hoops, your iron-on transfers, some fabric. And then obviously I wrote and put together the booklet, <clears throat> which has got all the instructions for the stitches and the projects in. So those are quite nice. And those were quite fun as well. They were also working to brief. So the publisher came up with the, the topic and then I had to design. So the latest one was called Natural Splendor. So it's full of insects, which as you know, I love stitching <laughs> and some more natural, natural designs, florals and that sort of thing. But Embroidered Home was, it was a great experience. And ironically, it came once we'd moved back to South Africa. So I was working across oceans. So I just thought, oh, if any of this had happened a year earlier, I could have been doing it while we were living in London. <laughs> but anyway, it was great and it, it worked out well to the point where it was even translated into Finnish, which was <laughs> quite exciting. Oh, my. So, yeah, yeah. yeah they, they, uh, a publishing company in Finland bought the rights and translated it, sent me a copy, and obviously I can't read a word of it, but the pictures <laughs> are all there. <laughs> they're all there, yeah. Wait, now they're, yeah. from your mom's perspective, that old adage, once a mom, always a mom. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And fortunately, she loves embroidery just as much as I do, so she doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seven, uh, 70 designs oh my word she must have there must have been a point where she said all right kelly enough of this <laughs> uh, definitely definitely and also in the point where we were like right we're not doing that again <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah one of those in a lifetime's got to be plenty yeah <laughs> absolutely and then but the nice thing about it was it 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 also like i said i learn with everything i do so it helped me out a lot. I, I quickly realized that people were not really finding a lot of the stitches that I used, especially the more out of favor ones. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about, okay, I'm going to have to start putting together stitch instructions. But the problem with stitch instruction, including these stitch instructions in a pattern, is that it makes the file sizes, it can push the file sizes up quite a lot, which is fine if you live somewhere with unlimited great internet fiber optic and all that. But if you live somewhere, for example, in Africa, where data is very expensive and not always accessible, I needed to keep the file sizes down. So that's when I started thinking about putting together an ebook of just all the stitches to accompany all the patterns. So that also took me more than a year to put together. I had to literally draw on the computer all the instructions for each of the stitches. So basically, it's an ebook. It's got all the written and illustrated instructions for for 120 stitches, obviously, but it's all the stitches that I've used in my designs, but they're also commonplace stitches. So you'll use them in other embroideries, other styles of embroidery as well. And then I did eight samplers to go with it. So the book split up into eight stitch families, and then each one's got a sampler as well that you can choose to buy separately if you want, if you want to work through the book. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's got all the stitches that I use in my designs. And a lot of people have also actually bought that because because it's an ebook, so they they save it onto their phone or their tablet, and they use it when they're stitching on the go or on holiday. Um, it's nice and easy to access, and it's also quite nice because you can zoom into the stitch instructions, so you can really see the nitty gritty and the detail of w where the thread should be going into the fabric, out of the fabric, through another part of the stitch, for example. So a lot of people are really liking that about the fact that it's a digital book. Which right. Is nice. Yeah. Well, that's you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm I'm all about paper, ink on paper. I mean, that's that's yeah. how I make a living. But that mm -hmm. is one area, ebooks, especially for for activities such as needlework, to put that on a tablet and do the very thing that you said to be able to zoom in, to annotate it, uh, all kinds of things. That's the technology really adds an element of power to. The, the access to the information, but also learning and remembering that you, you can't necessarily get with a, with a paper book. Yeah. And I've, and I've made it available as a, as a print quality document as well. So I have had a lot of people printing, they keep a copy on their tablet for when they're on the go and then they print it out as well and bind it into a book, which they keep next to their uh -huh. the chair. They do need to work in. So you, you can do both. Yeah. It's, it's totally up to you. So, yeah, and then when that worked really well, then that obviously led into the embroidery tips, tricks, and techniques, which I put together after 120 embroidery stitches, basically because I was getting questions almost every second day about how to do this style <laughs> of embroidery, how do I do this, how do I do that, and I was spending so much time answering questions that I realized there's actually a need for this book, and I got a lot of questions with people saying, I can do embroidery, but I want to do it 
I'd like to do it the way you're doing it. And I didn't think the way I was doing it was anything special, to be honest. But <laughs> yeah, I the, thought, the, well, the, I've the, just per, the response the to that is, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, in my mind, I was just following the stitch books. Right, right. That's kind of what I was doing. So anyway, I, I put it all down and I sort of had a good think. And I, I trolled back through all my emails and found all the questions people had asked me. And then put it all into one book and sort of explained. It's basically just my process, how I do it. And then little tips and tricks that I've picked up over time. Um, my whole process is quite detail oriented because that's just the kind of person I am. So in the book, I go through like how I choose fabric, cutting it, for example, in line with the warp and the weft of the weave which all adds to the final product. It's what makes it look the way it does. People use terms like crisp and clean when they describe my embroidery. And it, I think it all comes down to the fact that I take quite a lot of care at each step of preparing the project. It's not just about the, the embroidery part of it. Right. So I go into all of that in the book and then also a few more obscure things like I picked up a good trick for if you do prick your finger, which happens when you start getting a bit tired or lose concentration, and you do happen to get a dot of blood on your fabric, there's the best way is to just don't touch it and then to actually just spit a little bit on your finger and dab it onto the fabric. Apparently the enzymes in your own saliva will clean your own blood out of fabric. That's what I've been told. But it works, you know, especially if you're on white fabric, little things like that. So that's the kind of stuff you'll find in embroidery tips, tricks, and techniques, which is also an ebook. Yeah. So, th so with those two books, that's a real, real complete package for someone who wants to either learn embroidery or expand their skills. That those two give give a real nice uh, pair of, pair of uh, yeah. partnership of information, I guess. Yeah, if you if you have those two books, you'll easily be able to embroider any of my designs. So, and I actually sell them as a bundle at a reduced price in mm -hmm. my shop. So. So people can also get it for a little bit cheaper as well. <laughs> so, um, Nothing wrong with but that. Yeah. yeah, it helps people out. So, On your website, you have a little bio for Barbara Skinner. How does she fit into your operation? Barbara Skinner is my mom. <laughs> oh, well, that would now we know how she fits in. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly how she fits in. Yeah, she, um, you know, she's also an embroidery lover. She... She's actually the one. I don't have an art background, or I never did needlework at school, for example. They'd already dropped it from the curriculum by the time I got there. But she's the one who did needlework at school. She won the, the prize for needlework in her final year. And she is a skilled seamstress as well. She's she's done everything from sewing clothing to quilting to knitting, crochet, embroidery. She's done it all. So it's quite nice when, when I'm stuck on something or if I need to know how to sew something, I just pick up the phone and go, Mom, how do I do this? And <laughs> she's, she's normally got the answer, So as moms do. Yeah, they tend to do that. Oh, well, that's yeah. fantastic. I did not pick up on that, that she was your mother. So I thought, oh, there's a partner here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's, she's really good behind the scenes. She's a good sounding board. She's always happy to help me out with stuff. She's done it a few times. When I, started, when I first decided to open a shop on Etsy, I thought, well, let me get a good lot of new designs together to really like have an impact. And she helped me with, she helped help me embroider a lot of those as well. So yeah, she's been a very good help over the years and always very encouraging, which is which is nice and motherly. Always good to have someone behind you, <laughs> covering your butt, Absolutely. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> very grateful for it. Yeah, <laughs> you mentioned, uh, oh geez, how come we're always running out of time? You mentioned. Um, uh, your stitching area in the corner of the living room, do you have, you just have a chair and some tables or always curious about what people have uh, for a work area? It's developed over time. And I sort of, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what started We've all seen out as a movie. mishmash. <laughs> absolutely. What started out, it started out just as a mishmash of a table with my, with my computer on it and another table and a plastic tubs. And then about, probably about 18 months ago, I saved up and had two beautiful big cabinets built. So I customized it. I've got like a very long, thin cupboard down the one side for rolls of fabric and ironing stuff. I've got lots of drawers. I've got bookshelf space. And then I had a good clean out. And I was like, whatever doesn't fit in here, it's got to go. So <laughs> it looks a lot neater now than it used to. And then I also, as part of that, I saved up and bought myself a nice desk with two big drawers. So that keeps all my 
more the paperwork and that sort of stuff and stationery um, in those. And yeah, and then in my big cabinets, I've got all my fabric and far too many embroidery samples at this stage. I don't know what I'm going to do with all of them one day. <laughs> I feel sorry for whoever has to clean up after me when I die. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's looking quite neat and tidy at this stage. And it's nice. It's nice to have a, a dedicated area. It is just in a corner of our living room. And the dining room table gets shared between dining and working. <laughs> but it works It works for me. It forces me to tidy up at the end of the day as well. So. Yeah, I don't have that pressure to tidy up. And, yeah, you, you can tell. <laughs> my, I was looking just the other night. My big four-foot by two-and-a-half-foot table is – I have a little workspace in the middle in the front and – the rest of it's full of stuff, and I need to go through one of those clean outs where this got to go. This stuff's yeah, got to go was, somewhere I was else. About, <laughs> I was about to ask you, can you see the table? <laughs> not really. <laughs> Honest truth, not really. I, yeah, I got around that by actually buying a nice a, a tray with sort of raised edges, and I just keep all my the current project in one tray and projects to come in another, which is quite nice. You can just slide the tray out from yeah. its allocated space in the cabinet, of course. And you just slide that out and then move it to the couch or the table, <clears throat> wherever you're working. And I find that works quite well, being that I can't leave my projects out, you know. Yeah. So it's a nice workaround. I well, see. Now that's a good idea. Yeah, it I'll, will. It works, yeah. works well for me. I'll never implement it because mine's in a corner down in the family room where no one goes. So. Yeah. It sounds no, like your projects no are a bit bigger than mine as well. So. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. It's just a corner. It's just a corner, but yeah, I don't have any pressure to uh, keep it neat. But yeah, exactly. The, the other day it was, wait a minute, I don't have any work surface anymore. Something went wrong here. And, yeah. It happens. It happens. Yeah, we got to clean this mess up. Yeah, Kelly, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Gary. It has been lovely to chat to you. It's always so nice to really like get into the nitty gritty of embroidery with with the, with someone with a fellow stitcher, with somebody who loves it as much as you do. Yeah. So thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it. So uh, let's see. KellyFletcher.co.za is, is the website. There's a Facebook page. All the links for the podcast. Facebook page. All of her charts available at Etsy. Books available also on your Etsy site. There, If you just go to my website and look under books, there's links to all the different uh, areas there. The books and kits are all on Amazon as well. So. Oh, okay. Places like that, you'll find them there. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask about those kits, uh, so th I can get those on Amazon too. Then. Yeah, they're all on Amazon, as well as all sorts of other uh, bookstores and stuff. Who've got online presences there? They're yeah. sold through a lot of different distributors and in in a lot of different countries as well. So wherever you are in the world, you you'll probably be able to find a copy somewhere if you just do a search online. Excellent, Kelly. Thanks a lot. Enjoyed it. Great. Thanks, Gary. It was lovely. Thanks to everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs>